girls, and welcome to season three of the Hey Girl podcast with my mom, Bethany Needham. Each week, guests will share their amazing stories of following Jesus on all kinds of journeys. I hope their stories inspire you to run your race in your place. Thank you so much for listening. In just a few short weeks, we will be back with all new interviews to finish season three of Hey Girl. From now until Easter, we are sharing some of our favorite episodes from the archives. These interviews are worth discovering or listening to again. This week, we have Bethany's interview with Sharifa Stevens. Enjoy and keep being awesome for Jesus. All right, girls, I am here with definitely my new best friend. I mean... Hands down, this might have been the greatest lead up into hitting the record button of all time. I just, I don't even know how to describe the last 20 minutes other than we were meant to be, Sharifa. We were meant to be. We laughed, we cried. <laughs> it moved us. It, we were moved. It was better than cats. There was literally like hair being done, eyelashes, falling off <laughs> it it was epic i get it was you had to be there but sharifa why don't we start you want to say hey to the listeners hey i'm sharifa Stevens. girl i am <laughs> so excited to have you today to get the chance to talk with you hear your story you are my third guest third and final that Lori gave me three names okay girl, you were one of them so Lori brown harris Hey, Lori. Shout out. Yeah, she loves you. And I love, I that love her back. I know. It, it's just, I feel like she's one of those people that is would be impossible not to love. I just like, yeah. I just want to hang out with her one day. I'm going to, I'm going to do a road trip. It's, yes. I think you and I should meet up at, did you see her new job? She works. I saw her new job, mm -hmm. girl. We need to meet up at that restaurant and hang out with Lori Brown Harris. We, we must have communion mm -hmm. with chips and beer. Yes. <laughs> That's what we need to do. Lori Harris is like that. She's like uh, the bacon of people, you know, where you don't trust the person who doesn't like bacon. Mm -hmm. I love that description. Them. I'm going to take that with me. <laughs> I'd be like, <laughs> don't you just want to give that to someone? Girl, you are like the bacon of people. <laughs> Everybody needs you. You go good with everything. <laughs> you go so well. You bring such flavor and satisfaction and happiness and joy. Seriously. And the people who don't like the mm. bacon? Something's wrong. Something's I wrong. I just don't know. Sharifa, I am dying to know your story. <laughs> Literally. After the after the last 20-minute conversation, I want to know everything there is to know about you. Okay. So. Take the floor, lady. <laughs> All right. So about me, what is my story? My story is that, like I was telling you off the air, I'm, an, I'm a late bloomer. So I'm still trying to figure out a lot of aspects of who I am, um, of who God wants me to be. I am a first-generation American. I'm an only child. Apparently, I'm an Enneagram One. Really? What does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> You should you look know? that up. Yeah. So I heard I heard I'm I'm a perfectionist. So I do need to do more research on that. Like I said, late bloomer, still figuring things out. INFJ, wife of one, mother of two. It better than the um, reversed of that would be. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> that's that's a whole other hey girl <laughs> kind of podcast. <laughs> You know, I'd feel a lot more confident if this was the first time I've getting, gotten into a sister wife discussion on this podcast. Oh my goodness. Are you serious? I, I mean, need to know the episode and the show notes. <laughs> I'll, share, I'll share them after. It was it was in jest. She wasn't really a sister wife, but oh, okay, you know, wow. it just reminded me of it. Yes. Um, well, I'm not a sister wife, nor is my husband a uh, brother husband. We've been married almost 12 years. You might hear them in the background. We do not have the gift of quiet in this house. I'm the quiet one. For fun, I like to sleep 
And Amen. Uh, <laughs> it's one of my favorite pastimes. And I enjoy I enjoy waking without alarm clocks. This is rare. I have not woken up by choice since my firstborn mm-hmm. was born, who's kind of like a sleep optional kid. And he's going to be eight soon. Is he I still write, sleep optional? Yeah, he he could do every other day. I think he could do every other day. We're like, well, you're living here. And when you live somewhere else and can sustain your own life, you may sleep as little as you wish. Hmm. So Good parenting. Well, you know, that's for our survival as well. <laughs> so... <laughs> But he's an angel. Like, I have two boys who, y'all can't see my hair, but my hair is is pretty big. And my sons have, like, huge, curly, raven locks. And they get sun-kissed in the summer. And they're just, they have eyes of deep obsidian that just, they're so fearfully and wonderfully made. They're, They're just gorgeous and they are the most stubborn loud stinky smart genius spiritual theologian they are just everything they're all the things i love it yes they get their stinky from me and they get their their good looks from both of us and (laughs) honestly (laughs) yeah and their their brains are uh a very humorous combination of me and my husband (laughs) and my husband can both teach Latin and change, change oil in a, in a vehicle, um, which I cannot do. See, and that's why I'm inarticulate and he can coach people in rowing and he can serve a mean cappuccino. So he's got skills. He's got skills. Okay. But first of all, you are not inarticulate because, girl, <laughs> I was totally stalking you on your blog. Yeah, I was. And you, you have some <laughs> impressive education in your background. Thank you. And you are a writer. So I am a writer. So tell me a little bit about, first of all, your path in education and <laughs> what it looks like to be a, a writer. What do you write? Okay, so this is this is a complicated question. My path in education has been somewhat eclectic. I was African American studies major in undergrad. And I went to a pretty great school. And my only objective in my naivete was to attend a school in a city where I would never be able to live otherwise (laughs) because I couldn't afford the rent. So I went to school in Manhattan and got an incredible education that I, I I know we were talking about your secondary education and um, Canada in, in the U S or in my neck of the woods, which is the Bronx. It was really hard for me to find myself in the curriculum. There was not a lot of African-American studies beyond Martin Luther King, Harriet Tubman, and slavery, Mm -hmm. which I went to a school where I was in the minority. And it was always fun for everyone to turn to me during those sections of history (laughs) that talked about, you know, being enslaved or being attacked by dogs or not having the right to vote. So it got a little tired. But at the same time, I grew up in the epicenter of hip hop and just the, the, the roots of hip hop culture. And so it was a real rich, vibrant time to, to grow up. But I also, by the time I got to college, really wanted to know more about my background and what it was to be in the African diaspora. I got a great education with that. And my plan was to go to law school after that. And I interviewed some lawyers 
to see how they were doing, what they loved about their careers. And the ones that I interviewed all hated their jobs. So I didn't know what to, I was just like, okay. And the one lawyer who loved her job, loved her job. She was working as a producer for a daytime soap opera. So she wasn't using her JD at all. <laughs> so I was just like, hey, so how did you, I mean, did you, she's like, oh girl, I paid, I paid for law school with loans. And then I sweated for three years and paid off those loans by slaving away at a law firm. And then after that, I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. And I'm as happy as I could be. So I thought again about law school. And at the same time, I had an incredible young adult pastor, Jeff Gowling. I think he's Canadian. Of course he is, because he's incredible. Why is Canada like Canada? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So... Way to, in, oh, way to in, insult an entire country. <laughs> it's okay. Um, We're not easily offended. I just offended. made up Canada. I just made <laughs> up a country. It's like right between New York and Canada. Okay, so <laughs> Canada just wends its way through my life in a beautiful way. And the least I could do is just pronounce it correctly. <sighs> anyway. Nah, that'd be too easy. <laughs> I know. So, so anyway, so he was Canadian. He was Canadian from Canada. I got you. <laughs> he was so instrumental in the development of my spiritual formation and the spiritual formation of our entire group. We were just bonded together as friends, but also as seekers of Jesus. And I had grown up in a Christian household, but. It was kind of mysterious, like, oh, you have a problem? Pray about it. Open the Bible and see what the Lord has to say. But I was like, I don't know. I opened the Bible to like Leviticus 12, and I don't know what that has to do with like what I take for my electives. You know, there was just some good stuff in terms of, yes, I should pray and I should read the Bible, but how? Like, where? how do I do this? And when when my pastor started teaching us how to live with one another, how to encourage one another, how to pray for one another, how to read the Bible together, it was profound. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to study God's law as a result of that. And I started looking at seminaries instead of law schools. I definitely wanted to stay in the Northeast and my pastor uh, was a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary, which was in Dallas. So I was just like, well, clearly that's not my path. So that's cool. He was gently insistent that I check out DTS. I decided to apply there knowing full well that I would not be accepted to the school because I did not go to a Bible college. I had a completely secular background. I am also a woman and why do women go to seminary? You know, like I had all of these really completely inaccurate views <laughs> of women, women's role in ministry, seminary. And so I knew I wasn't going to get accepted. So when that happened, I was just like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to seminary in Texas. I, I got a master's in theology from Dallas Theological Seminary. <laughs> <laughs> That's when amazing. I went, it's it was such a privilege on so many levels. I wanted to study God's law and I thought Bethany like I thought well, here's what I'll do. I'll study what the role of women in ministry is and I'm going to solve it while I'm there. We appreciate that. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So, and I was just like easy, right? As soon as I read the Greek and the Hebrew, I'm going to know everything I need to know. So, Again, naive and inaccurate, but it, it was such a great opportunity for me to grow spiritually. It was such a beautiful space full of great mentors, professors, peers who helped spiritually form me. 
and who helped me to mature in the faith. And I am deeply indebted to Dallas Seminary for that. I did not solve anything I set out to solve, (laughs) but I learned to ask more sophisticated questions. And I also realized that it is vitally important, just like it was important in my young adult group. It is vitally important to exegete, exposit, read, um, study, context, words, culture as a community. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't just be one person. I, that's not how God has worked. Not since even the Garden of Eden. We've never been on our own. The best things, like the 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 fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, all of these things happen in community. And I realized even in seminary as well as like in my education in general, that there's there's usually one dominating voice. But that's not that's not the story of the Bible. The story of the Bible is not the story of Western civilization. It's not the story of all the great um, empires. They play a part, but it do you notice how small that part is? God's looking at this one man, this one pagan, um, and calling him out to follow him. And he's, he's looking at this one people that have nothing going for them apart from him. And he's saying, I'm going to make you great. And I'm going to make you great so that you can bless the nations. And he's not focused on what's going on in Egypt and Persia, what's going on with Alexander the Great, what's going on. Well, he's like, these great civilizations are a backdrop to his story of love for the unseen and the marginalized. I think we're missing out when, like, for example, in, in our country, in, in, in the United States, we're missing out if we don't have the voices of indigenous people, the voices of native peoples, who who know what it is to be displaced, who know what it is to live in occupied territory in their own land, reading and exegeting the gospel message. And, you know, like we should be chewing on that with them together in a place of learning, in a place of humility. We miss out if we don't chew on, marinate on the gospel message with Black people in America. People who who know what it is to depend on God and not on government, just like the first century church. We miss out on the the multicolor of the first century church of like the book of Acts when we don't stop to see Philip talking to an Ethiopian eunuch and, and paying attention to that. Or we don't look at the conflict of Hellenistic Jews with the Jerusalem Jews who are widows, right? The the conflict of of not getting enough resources and and how the the elders decided to address the problem head on so that it would be solved. We miss out when we look, for lack of a better term, in a colorblind way to a very multicolored gospel message. The best thing I've seen in going to the seminary is that I have so many friends from different backgrounds who who came to the seminary from uh, Romania or, like me, from the Bronx (laughs) or from from India or from Korea or from St. Louis or California and and have have perspectives that are are essential as as members of the body to work through work through the text together to live out the text hmm. together not just work through it but to live live it out wow that's a long answer no that I, <laughs> I, I <literally, laughs> I'm sitting here like taking notes as fat but you <laughs> you say big words Sharifa oh Darn smart like what? people. I don't know if I could spell it, then it would be an issue. <laughs> no, I 
I loved it. A question in regards to that. So what does that look like in your life? I am with you and like just am amen and amen about the importance of studying scripture and community. So obviously seminary is something you've been through seminary. That's not your current season of life. What does studying scripture and community look like as a wife and a mom of two beautiful children? So that's a great question. And the beauty of the Holy Spirit, right? And the, the beauty of the, the incredible accessibility that we enjoy in this, this country is that we can do it wherever we are. So for me, right now I'm in this weirdo. Okay. So I'm in this weirdo transition where I used to work outside of the home and now I'm working at home and I'm homeschooling my children. And I'm like a homeschooler work from home mom now. So I'm learning how to put on that hat. Yeah. And part of what we do the luxury I have as a homeschooling mom is that I'm talking to my children about the Bible and my children are helping me to understand because they ask really good questions. They want to know, okay, so, so communion, communion is one of those things where a child is like, okay, so am I eating Jesus? Um, when we, (laughs) like when we take communion, are we eating? So these are great questions to ask or, or is God always with me? Is he with me when I'm, when I'm going potty? (laughs) Um, I always wanted to know that. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And these are, I'm like, I'm never thinking about these things. And then I was, I was mourning the death of my grandfather. And my seven-year-old put his hand on my shoulder and he was like, your grandfather is sleeping. You will see him again. (laughs) This is what the Bible says. We will be like Jesus. And I, yeah, I don't, I don't have words. I just got goosebumps all in my arms and my, right. Your seven-year-old. My seven-year-old was like, he is, he is asleep. Hmm. One day. He's going to rise. This is, this is my inheritance, right? Sometimes I, you know, we, we're, we're, we're modest. We don't, we don't have a whole lot in terms of material. And sometimes I worry about that, but this is our inheritance is my seven year old Hmm. sharing the, the wonder of the resurrection with me and understanding also that I am mourning. And that death and grief is a part of our current circumstances. And it's very real. And I don't try to sugarcoat it for them because death is real and our enemy is real. Hmm. And he is, he's out to get us. But I tell you, I I work out the way I, I live because of the way they digest the scriptures and the questions that they ask that refine the articulation of my faith. The practice yeah. of my faith. Also, there's Voxer. Like, there's Voxer. Girl, I love Voxer. Don't you love? So I did it. I was like, I don't need another app, right? And one of my girlfriends was like, okay, but just get it for me. Okay. Voxer is a vehicle of working out faith together. Is it not? It's a way where you can confess your sins to one another so that you can be healed. <laughs> it's a it's it's a vehicle of prayer. I am not even kidding. I have one. Girl, girl this friend. is the best advertisement for Voxer that has ever oh, been out on this podcast. <laughs> okay, Voxer or similar communicate. I mean, like, there's one girlfriend who I Marco Polo with. And we talk about faith and we talk about politics and we talk about haircuts like we're doing. And because she lives far away. Right. And then on Voxer, one of my friends, her name is Kat. She every Monday at 9 a.m. She's praying and she'll share her prayer for me over Voxer. Right. And we'll talk. We'll talk through things we're working on in terms of our places where we're hurting, right? 
because since I'm home, I'm home a lot. I'm by myself a lot. I'm with, or I'm with kids a lot. It could feel really isolated. And we have this technology that keeps us connected. And I, I'm enjoying using it that way because so often technology has been like ulcer inducing, right? Social media is ulcer inducing and incessant, right? It keeps going. You get those notifications, you get that 24 hour news, news cycle. It's harder to turn off. And so I'm, I'm trying to redeem social media in my life by using it as a way to connect to the people of faith when I'm, when I'm by myself, when I feel by myself. I had a visual the other day as I was boxing with a friend, because first of all, I'm totally adding you on Boxer now. Ah, <laughs> this is, yay! this is going Boxer <laughs> level friendship. <Yes! laughs> but as I was boxing back and forth with my best friend and I thought, so she just moved away. She moved to Georgia almost a year ago. And I was like, this reminds me, if you go back in the day when the kids would have the tin cans and the string that they tie between when yes. your next door neighbor and you pull it tight and you whispered all your secrets in and they could sit and listen. I was like, this is like the most modern technology version of that day. And it's a beautiful thing because if no yes. one's ever used the app, it's basically like turning your phone into a two-way radio yes. where you kind of, and it even makes that sound that a radio yes! makes, but you leave, you can like leave a quick message for someone. And then in their time at their pace, like they can listen, message you back. Sometimes mm -hmm. my friends and I have our phones open at the same time. So if they're talking and boxers open, it talks into your phone, just like a radio. Those are exactly. my favorite moments where you're like, we're literally having this, like, but then if you have to, cause you're a busy mom or this is why I always yes. tell people, Sometimes, like if I'm, they're like, why not just be on the phone? I was like, because if something happens, which always happens, a kid needs always. me after run, then you don't want to just hang up the phone on someone. But on Voxer, you basically like you just stop listening, but then you come back to it later and they can yes. leave as long a message. I, I think it's incredible. I love that you're a Voxer girl. Yes. I, and I admit I was reluctant until my friend Delina, she was like, so today's the day you're gonna, you're gonna use it and we're gonna talk yes. and we're gonna run out of things to talk about, but we're gonna talk. We haven't run out of things to talk about yet. So the best I don't think it's gonna happen. The best I friendships. Know. <laughs> I know. Oh. So Sharifa, tell me this, uh, Hey girl, our whole like slogan, I don't know what you call it is kind of encouraging women of all ages and stages of life to run their race in their place. Mm. And what is it for you? This, we talked about your marriage, you have two kids, your homeschool mom. What does your race look like right now? We've kind of alluded to some, you're a writer, but yes. talk us through like just a picture of this lane that God has you in right now. That is, first of all, that is a great slogan. I, I love that. Thank and you. I love it because it's so biblical. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's, we're supposed to set our eyes on, on Jesus and lay aside all the encumbrances and for the joy set before us, we follow him and he's the one who endured the cross and despised the shame. Girl, preach. I'm going to record you and put you on our website. <laughs> okay. Well, do what, look, the author of Hebrews, I mean, Hebrews is just one long, amen. It's just, it's just, anyway, that's another thing. So my lane right now, I am convinced that the Lord has given me a mission of reconciliation hmm. and it's why I keep camping out on community in a culture that's very individualistic. I think that reconciliation necessitates an interdependence that God set in the Garden of Eden, a need for, for us to work together, a need for us to build God's kingdom by confirming and, and setting each other free to use our God-given gifts. 
And I think that the, the most tried and true tactic of the enemy is isolation and hiding. So I think reconciliation, I know reconciliation looks like an acknowledgement of sin, a need for forgiveness uh, after repentance, and then a reconciling both to God and to each other. And I think that here in the U.S., we're broken when it comes to that. We pride ourselves on on independence, not interdependence. Hmm. It's almost as if we don't need Jesus in order to do do church. Like neediness is is a shame, right? Interdependence is a shame, but I, I don't see how we do reconciliation to God and one another without those those things. We can't we can't be independent and reconciled at the same time. My lane is is paying attention to when things are fractured and broken and calling them that and saying repent. I see it a lot like with with our sisters who so many of us have suffered through uh, sexual assault. So many of us have suffered through harassment. So many of us have calluses on our souls where we've been told so many times that in order to be worthy, we have to look a certain way. We have to dress a certain way. We have to be smart, but not too smart, funny, but not too goofy. We can be athletic, but not too muscular. We should wear skirts, but not after a certain length. We should love God, but not usurp authority by, you know, don't love him too well or else you can't be led. (laughs) So like we've been told so many things that we've developed these calluses on our souls and these shackles, these invisible shackles, right? So an empowered church looks like empowered women and men working together. Hmm. An empowered church um, is, is a church that... I don't know about your, your church, but far too many churches in my area are divided and they're they're divided because of comfort. So there's a white church and there's a black church and there's a, a Korean church. There's a Latinx church and I don't see how we can pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. When in heaven, we know good and well, we're not going to be separated. Hmm. So what are we doing? We need reconciliation, but it's hard work. Cause just, I don't know about your marriage, but in my marriage, it's, it's hard work to be reconciled. It's hard work to be able to say, I'm sorry. Can you forgive me? It's hard work to sleep next to someone you're mad at. But once we go through that difficult work, we are so close. Hmm. We, we know each other so much better. We don't have anything to hide. You know, like we, we know our strengths and our weaknesses. We, and we know that the love that we have is what is, is going to bind us in, in the hard times. We don't know that kind of love in church. And, and marriage is one picture, but the church is a really important picture of what that kind of faithful, loyal friendship and love looks like. And it's not according to how we, how we phenotypically present. It's according to who we, who we serve. It's, it's according to who Jesus is in our life. And I really want to see that done on earth as it is in heaven. Girl, I love your lane. 
<laughs> Join me. It's a wide lane. <laughs> no, I'm just, I love what God's laid on your heart, but I love that you're, you're running the race that he's in that this race is important. It is. And I would dare say that this lane is wide because we're all supposed to be running together. Like mm-hmm. recon- this, we have the ministry of reconciliation. I'm not making it up for Sharifa Stevens. You know, this was in Paul's epistle. This is, this is the greatest command that you love. You love the Lord, your God. You love your neighbor as yourself. Mm. This lane is, is wide for a reason. Like we're all running. It's not just me, but so in, in a sense, I guess that's not the answer to the question because that's universal. We should be, I would say we should all be doing that. It's a track. It's, <laughs> right? it's, it's a track we all should be running on. We should and, all be running on it. But I think specific, one of the things that is specific to your lane is the voice that God's given you into it. And the passion in your heart to speak to that and the wisdom in which you speak to it, which I just think is really, I think it's powerful. Thank you. I think it's, it's the spirit. We all have it. Hmm. I think, I think that it's really, and it can be really intimidating, especially when it comes to talking about race. Oh my goodness. People would rather talk about their tax returns than, and, and their salaries, which nobody wants to talk about. Right. But they would prefer to talk about that than talk about race in this country. It is so hard, right? And you want to know what's, you want real talk? Hey girl, we all about real talk. You want to know what's hard about talking about race is when you are the whitest (laughs) blonde hair, blue eye, ain't no business talking about. But seriously, like sometimes I'm like, I feel like I represent a people that has said and done too much and needs to shut up and start listening. Mm. And, and not, I mean, I don't mean to say that we, you know, no white person has anything good to say or, but I, I do think there's a part of me that's like, I have a lot to hear that I have not heard. And so for me, yeah, I'm in, I'm on that track with you, but I feel like my lane looks different in the sense that I feel like I actually need to do less talking and more Mm -hmm. listening and more taking Mm -hmm. notes. And Mm. yeah. And that's, and sometimes it does make it scary to talk about and to venture into, cause you're like, there's already been so much hurt. There's already been like, I, I don't want to add to that at the same time. I think that there the enemy would love to use that to keep, to keep me completely out of it. Like I'm just staying out of it, but I do think that there's a part of it that I'm called to step in and listen and learn and grow. And like you said, to, to be reconciled, I feel like the posture for me is very much a repentant and humble spirit walking in and like, you know what, it may not have been my mouth that said it or my hands that did it, but (laughs) I do. I think it's, you have a powerful voice right now. And I just think it's incredible to hear you Thank talk you. about it. And Thank for me you. to be able to learn from you too. Like this is girl, yeah. I have like two pages of notes. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's crazy. So, and here's the thing, like I, I've spoken one of, one of the ways I work this out is Tasha Morrison has a ministry called be the bridge to mm-hmm. racial unity. And it's a small group based ministry where you start up a group, with folks of color, white folks, and we start talking through curriculum, be the bridge curriculum. And I remember last year, before I even started leading a group, I was in a panel discussion about it as the resident newbie. And there was a auditorium full of women and it was a predominantly white audience. And we were talking about all these issues of race and, and Christianity And I remember looking out into the auditorium and the faces I saw were overwhelmed and ready to do something and feeling helpless. Like I could feel, I could see it all over people's faces and they were just like, weak. this is too big. And what I want you and anyone listening to know, especially my white sisters, 
is that um, in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. Hmm. Right. And I believe that thoroughly. But I also believe that there is untapped, unharnessed power that my white sisters have hmm. to be Jesus in this country, to, to have the discernment to know when to speak and to speak um, as sisters, right? Um, and I, what I want is to empower us. I want to empower us to work together. That doesn't mean that my voice is the only voice that's working towards justice or um, love. That means that we're all working towards being more like Jesus. And I think it was Luke chapter four, verse 18, where Jesus is talking about he's he's in the synagogue and he's reading Isaiah 61 and he's talking about how I wish I had it in front of me but he came to give sight to the blind and to set the captives free and that this has been fulfilled in everyone's hearing he was like declaring the beginning of his ministry the ministry was you know we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Mm. And he's like, I'm giving you a way out. Mm. We have so much to gain. It's not just me as a person of color who has something to gain. It's you. It's all of us because we've been missing elements of our own body. Yeah. Right. There's, we're all missing out. Our, our, our body is losing mm. when we're not working together. Guilt is not strong enough to be an adequate motivation for my white sisters. I don't want that for my white sisters because God doesn't want that. Right? Mm. What, but I want, I want power from the Holy Spirit to move us towards having on earth what is true in heaven. And I want to bear, bear witness to who God is based on how we love. It's intimidating, but it's just a muscle that needs flexing. You know, it's just like any muscle that needs flexing. This is a necessary conversation because in our country, we are so separated and we have been since the, the first enslaved person in 1619 and the economy and, and the systems that were put in place that keep us separated. Mm -hmm. What kind of witness would it be if we would not let the systems of, the, of this world, the kingdom of this world, dictate how we treated one another, how we cared for one another, how we loved one another? What if we were characterized by an otherworldly love that manifested itself in a way that was stronger than what separated us? Mm -hmm. What if we really believed that God, through Jesus Christ, abolished the dividing wall? What if we, like the Apostle Paul, would oppose even Peter to his face when he started treating Gentile believers differently than Jewish believers? What if we were those people? What what would that do to our communities of faith? What would that do in our country and in our world? What would that do? That's what I want to I want to know. <laughs> Girl, you know, we're going to find out. Know. That's what. Yes. That's, that's the inheritance I want for our children. Hmm. That's the inheritance I want for our children, an inter inheritance of love, an inheritance of of Christ selfless Love, a love that lays down its life. I just have praise hand emojis floating through my, <laughs> my <right now. laughs> all, all the praise hands, all of them, <laughs> in all the colors too. It just is all the colors, all the colors, all the praise hands. It's a beautiful yes, thing. It is, girl. I feel like this is a friendship we could just talk all night. I'm like, okay, that's it. I'm going. I'm coming to Texas, and we're going to sit down. And oh, I would much rather go to Boston. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to be honest. I'd much rather you come to Boston. So let's go that direction. Let's just do that. <laughs> Here, before I can wrap us up, though, I do have to ask you one last question. 
because now you're all educated and throwing big words at me. <laughs> I need I need to bring you back down, back down to my level, so this friendship can remain. <laughs> Sharifa, please, please tell me that you have something that is incredibly superficial about you. Oh, okay, right. I knew this question was coming. How do I narrow it down to one? Uh, so I'm prone. I'm prone to to uh, spontaneous dance parties. But see, even that, that music is not superficial. Music is wonderful. Girl, that's fun. That's not. Superficial. It's the nectar of life. It's got to be like obsession with hair which your hair is pretty epic oh, yes. so there's so that. yeah the listeners don't know so we're like we're like seeing each other on mm-hmm. facetime right now i was my hair gonna out like you. half done yeah but now i'm gonna i'm out, out you. i'm out myself <laughs> because i was like please do not facetime me with this hair in transition my hair is admittedly okay so i guess that's superficial i'm i'm just real vain about my hair because it's glorious it, your hair is glorious but i do <laughs> i do feel like i need i need to just put it out there that <laughs> that everyone knows that when you were like we're just doing audio right and i was like uh we usually record video and you were like talking yourself into it like i I can do that. No, it's it's, and I can hear you taking yeah. the clips out of your hair as a okay. Like, oh, you could. Hold on. Yes. oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Uh, they're like these big. There's these metal clips. I love it. And I'm, I was I'm like, my I really wish that we had this. recorded the conversation where you were talking yourself into oh my letting me video chat you. Yeah, it's, like, <laughs> it's totally fine. It doesn't matter what I look like. Yeah, it's fine. You're like, okay, yeah, you can see my house. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's, that's fine. <laughs> I didn't I didn't clean it. And it's messy. There are piles of books. Well, oh, 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 let me tell you about this book. <laughs> Product placement. This book is called Vindicating the Vixens. Revisiting sexualized, vilified, and marginalized women of the Bible. Let me tell you. Sharifa, we got through the whole thing without saying sex, and then you threw it in at the end. Oops. (laughs) Sex. Um... Uh, well, I'm gonna, I did say sexualized. That's true. Um, I'm actually just completely. Different. I'm going to link that in our show notes because I saw that on your blog. Yeah. But we'll also link your blog. So people, your blog, your Instagram, all the things so people can follow you because they're going to want to. They're you gonna can follow me, but I'm really shy. Um, <laughs> and I kind of want to hide at the same time. But like, again, social media is where you can connect. Mm-hmm. with people and and encourage them but it's also like a really big and scary place though so i'm like the introverted social media person i hear you i hear you sharifa this has been so fun i <laughs> it's not even just been fun i feel like we have covered such a broad spectrum of comp that we have no choice but to be forever friends. So yes, we will be voxering. Um, you uh, you didn't tell them about magnetic eyelashes, but that's fine. That's fine. That'll Girl, be that'll be like I our wasn't secret. out in my cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> and your I'm... fabulous hair! Oh my goodness, guys! When she Facetime, she looks gorgeous. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm like, am I wearing something clean? Is there any coffee on this? Oh, you're the bacon of people. Yes. And it comes full circle. (laughs) Best compliment I could have ever seen. I'm so glad. I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Sharifa, I have loved this. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me. It's been such a hoot. (laughs) 